This is Winchester Academy. Well, thank you. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Thank you very much. As she said, I did give a talk here two years ago on alcohol in the brain. And at the end of the talk, all the questions dealt with marijuana. <laughs> so I thought maybe that would be a good talk to give here. So, and at the end of the talk, there will be time for questions, but not for answers. <laughs> so bear with me. Okay then, we will start talking about medical marijuana, but there is a lot of information that I want to talk about. All this stuff, there is a lot that we'll deal with. Oh, Go briefly over the history of marijuana, uh, marijuana use, composition, mode of action. How does it work? What are the negative effects of marijuana? Then how can it be a medicine? Uh, research issues, uh, the most recent interest in CBD medication. You will understand what CBD is by the end of the talk and then uh, a recent uh, summary report. And by the way, I did hear that a couple of weeks ago, apparently there was someone giving a talk about beer and they had free samples. <laughs> I do not have any free samples. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, we will move on then. Talk a little bit about the history of it. Marijuana use probably began in China and then spread to India, the Middle East, and the Arab world. Actually, marijuana, or probably more appropriately, hashish, which is a very concentrated form of the active substance, played a large role in the 1001 Arabian Nights. Those stories. And Napoleon soldiers brought marijuana back from Egypt to France, where it became very popular. This is a bit of the history of marijuana use. Again, probably originating in China. And the first laws in the United States legalizing medical use of marijuana occurred in 1996. Hemp was grown here in the United States, even by George Washington at Mount Vernon. Now, he didn't smoke it. Rather, it was grown for fiber. 
that was used to make um, rope and sails. So most marijuana at that time was very tall, which is why it's very difficult to hide in your closet if you're a student at uh, <laughs> a university. Marijuana smoking probably began in the 1900s here with Mexican and Caribbean immigrants. In 1937, the Marijuana Tax Act was instituted here in the United States. It was designed to be a tax act, but basically prohibited anyone from having anything to do with marijuana. It was later declared unconstitutional, but a year after that, it was included on the Federal Controlled Substances Act of 1970 as what is called a Schedule one drug. That means it has a high potential for abuse and no accepted medical use. That's from the federal government's perspective. So it's included in the same category as heroin, for example, in the federal government. Now, marijuana is, however, the most commonly used illicit drug in the United States. Most common among people ages 18 to 25, although 48% of adults in the US report having used marijuana at some time in their life. And I'm guessing that's the people on this half of the room over here. <laughs> yeah. So, Legalized marijuana? Well, 29 states have legalized it. Some allow for both recreational and medical use. But again, for the federal government, it's still a Schedule I drug. So you might be able to use it legally as far as your state's concerned, but not as far as the federal government is concerned. Recognize that? Something your son or daughter brought home from college? <laughs> okay, so what is it? Well, it's a mix of leaves, flowers, stems, just about anything, usually from cannabis sativa or cannabis indica, uh, two subspecies. Common names include grass, weed, pot, reefer, Mary Jane. Two ways of administration include smoking and eating. And there is quite a difference in terms of the time of onset and duration of action. The onset of action, smoke, is about five minutes. The longer you hold your Marijuana inside breath hold duration really has nothing to do with it. Peak blood levels occur in about 10 minutes, and the obvious effects last for two to three hours. With oral administration, you don't absorb it as well. Uh, the onset is in 30 to 60 minutes, and the peak effects occur two to three hours after intake. So if you're eating those cookies over there, it may take you a couple of hours before you notice the effect. <laughs> so, there you have some uh, joints. I took that picture in my, my wife's nightstand. <laughs> and then there's a tobacco cigarette uh, for comparison. Okay, marijuana is a complex mixture. There are more than 400 compounds, so it's not a single substance like alcohol, for example. It's a very complex structure chemically. Um, the most abundant cannabinoids, and they're called cannabinoids, uh, that is, things having to do with marijuana, are delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol that's abbreviated THC, that's probably what you've heard the most of. That's the, comp the compound that makes you high. Then there's cannabidiol, 
abbreviated CBD, and that might be the most medically useful component. And then another one is cannabidiol, uh, cannabinol. And here are the chemical structures in case you want to synthesize those sometime in your basement. <laughs> now, marijuana has changed over the years. It's not your dad's pot anymore. <laughs> because most marijuana growers make the drug as potent as possible in terms of the THC content. So in the 1960s and 70s, THC concentrations were about 1 to 2 percent. Now they're 20 percent or more. So they're mu it's much more potent now than it used to be. Colorado did a test of marijuana sold there in 2015. THC content was 20 to 30 percent. There was no CBD in it, and there were a lot of contaminants, including bacteria, fungi, and metal elements like arsenic. How does it work? I know some of you are thinking, well, very well. <laughs> Well, we'll see. Well, the human body has what's called an endocannabinoid system. Endo meaning uh, internal. And it receives and translates signals it receives from cannabinoids in the body. As we will see, um, your body makes its own. So regardless of your political persuasion, your body grows its own weed, basically. <laughs> And those uh, cannabinoids that your body makes are called endocannabinoids. Okay. THC, as I mentioned, is the compound that produces a high. And we'll see in a little while the brain structure that's responsible for that. And CBD is quite different. It's not psychoactive, meaning it doesn't produce a high. Instead, it influences the endocannabinoids that your body naturally produces. Now, it turns out, if your body makes that, it must make receptors for the endocannabinoids and for the cannabinoids that are found in marijuana. Otherwise, marijuana would not have an effect if there were no receptors for it. And your body does make two different types of cannabinoid receptors, first discovered in 1988. The main one, as far as psychoactivity, is the CB1 receptor. It's the one that's found in the central nervous system. There's a CB2 receptor that occurs in the immune system, uh, fat cells, the GI tract, and so on. That's responsible for other uh, non-psychoactive effects of cannabinoids. There are CB1 receptors throughout the central nervous system. And I'm not going to uh, show you where all of these are, but a couple. Uh, there are CB1 receptors in the hippocampus, for example. Now, some of you might know that the hippocampus is a part of the brain involved in forming new memories. What did the hippocampus say in his retirement speech? Thanks for the memories. <laughs> there are also CB1 receptors in the cerebral cortex. The cerebral cortex is the outer covering of the brain. Cortex Cortex means bark. And just like the bark of a tree is the outer covering, so the cerebral cortex is the outer portion of the brain. How can you tell that a tree is a dogwood tree? By its bark. Yeah, my wife told me not to say that, but I like it anyway. <laughs> 
the basal ganglia and cerebellum are involved in movement, and that explains uh, movement problems that you might have. For example, you're not a good driver while stoned, even though most people do drive while they're under the influence of marijuana. The hypothalamus is involved in the control of motivation. So if you get the munchies after smoking marijuana, that's because of, because of CB1 receptors in the hypothalamus. And then there are CB1 receptors in the spinal cord. And I'll show you a cross-section of the spinal cord in a minute because that's where marijuana helps in pain relief. And there you see the cerebral cortex. You're looking at the left, the left hemisphere of the brain. It's a side view of the left side of the brain. And you're looking at the cerebral cortex. Now, you can divide the cerebral cortex into various lobes or divisions. As shown here, the very front of the brain is the frontal lobe. You see that on the far left there? The front of the frontal lobe, let's see if I can, right there, is the so-called prefrontal cortex. That's where your personality resides. Now that part of the brain is not fully mature until you're about 30 years old. By mature, I mean, I mean myelinated, I, I, that may not make much sense to a lot of you, but neurons, and I'll show you a neuron in a little while, uh, uh, have a myelin coat that increases the speed at which that neuron sends a message. And your prefrontal lobe is not fully myelinated until you're around 30. And it's wise not to take any uh, substance that will interfere with that maturation of the prefrontal lobe. And that would include not only marijuana, but alcohol and other things. That's a half section of the brain. It, it's the brain that's sliced on the middle, and you're looking at the middle part. Now here, I can show you roughly where the hypothalamus is. And the main structure I wanted to show you here is this base of the brain stem called the medulla. The medulla contains structures that control vital reflexes of the body, like breathing. There are, recept there are centers in the medulla that make you breathe. There's one center that makes you inhale, another that makes you exhale. Now, you may have heard of the opioid epidemic, and a lot of people die from an opioid overdose. That's because they stop breathing. And they stop breathing because there are opioid receptors in the medulla. There are no CB1 receptors in the medulla. Therefore, you're not going to die from an overdose of marijuana. Marijuana is not lethal. Now, if you smoke marijuana and get into a car accident, you might die. But marijuana in and of itself is not lethal because there are no CB1 receptors in the medulla. Everyone follow that? There's the spinal cord. It's about the size of your little finger. And you can see there are nerves coming in and going out of the spinal cord. If we were to cut it and make a cross section of it, it would look like this. That's the back of the spinal cord. This is the front. The back part towards your back is called the dorsal side. This front side is the ventral side. Sensory information enters the spinal cord over the dorsal root. 
That's where incoming pain information enters the nervous system. And there are CB1 receptors on the um, axon endings there that can inhibit uh, the transmission of pain information, which is why um, marijuana is useful in relieving pain. Okay? So, what are the immediate effects of marijuana? Well, it alters your mood, you have cognitive changes, your perception is altered, your coordination and balance are impaired, you're hungry, your anxiety is reduced, maybe a little drowsy. Uh, it seems that uh, colors appear brighter, for example. Your heart rate increases, and in high doses, you might have hallucinations. Not as much as with LSD. Um, if you're looking at a picture on the wall with marijuana, it might seem to shimmer. With LSD, it'll climb down off of the wall and come over and talk to you. <laughs> it's a bit different. Now, as I mentioned, it's because of the CB1 receptors that marijuana has effects. So, as I mentioned earlier, the basal ganglia and the cerebellum are involved in movement. That's why marijuana can cause movement problems. And that's why you're not a good driver under the influence of marijuana. At the campus, it's why marijuana affects memory. Your frontal cortex, in particular the prefrontal cortex, is what gives you the high. The CB1 receptors there that cause the high, as well as an altered sense of time. If you're feeling like this talk is lasting too long, we all know why. <laughs> Hypothalamus, that is what produces the munchies. Spinal cord, as I already mentioned, produces the pain reduction and there are none in the medulla, which is why it is not lethal. Okay? So, why do humans have receptors for a compound made by plants? Well, either God intended everyone to smoke marijuana, or the brain makes its own cannabinoids. And as I already mentioned, the brain makes its own, the so-called endocannabinoids. Two of them have been discovered, anandamide and another compound abbreviated 2-AG. They work at the connection between neurons, which is called a synapse, and unlike the regular neurotransmitters in the brain, which are released by an axon ending and go to a dendrite or cell body, the, endo, the endocannabinoids go backwards. They're called retrograde transmitters. They go from the dendrite or cell body back to the axon. So they make things go in reverse. And here are the chemical structures of anandamide and 2-AG. And there you have a neuron. Your brain contains about 100 billion neurons. I tell my students at Lawrence not to worry about that number because I won't expect them to know, to know any more than half of them by name. <laughs> so the neuron contains a cell body or soma, an axon, it's the axon that sends the message, and the axon comes down their little axon end feet there that form a synapse with other neurons. And you can see the myelin sheath along the axon. You can think of an axon as a 10-foot long hot dog, and each segment of myelin is like a hot dog bun around it. So this is an enlarged 
schematic view of a synapse. Here you have the axon ending, a gap called the synaptic cleft, and a dendrite or cell body. The dendrite or cell body has receptors on it that normally receive the neurotransmitter released by the axon ending. Now with anandamide or 2-AG, that compound is actually made here in the dendrite and goes backwards to affect receptors in the axon ending. So it does everything in reverse. Well, that's right. You're supposed to wait till the end for questions. I was going to ask you if you had any questions about this. Okay. So we've had an overview now of the brain, and I'll spend a little time talking about negative effects when smoke. You probably all think of the positive ones, but there are some possibilities that are negative. First, smoking marijuana can lead to respiratory illness. One marijuana cigarette causes many breathing problems as four to ten tobacco cigarettes. So you have an increased risk for bronchitis, emphysema, and lung cancer. There are also cardiovascular complications. Blood pressure and heart rate will increase. And you have nearly five times the risk of a heart attack in one hour after use. So I tell my students, think twice before you offer grandpa a joint. <laughs> and then what about cancer? Well, smoke is smoke. Smoke is bad for the lungs. And unfortunately, marijuana smoke contains several of the same carcinogens and co-carcinogens as tobacco cigarettes. And most of these are found in the tar, and marijuana smoke has about three times uh, the amount of tar as tobacco smoke. So you're not doing your lungs any good. And these are the results of a study on this. And it basically concluded that long-term marijuana use increases the risk of lung cancer in young adults. The risk increased 8% for each joint year of marijuana smoking. A joint year is one joint per day for one year. You can also have cognitive problems. Use of four joints or more per week resulted in a decrement in a mental test performance. The more subjects smoke, the worse their performance. And there are other problems. You will be impaired if you smoke, just like you're impaired if you use other drugs. Also, something on this slide that you may not have heard of, you may get the amotivational syndrome. This was first described in the 1970s by two clinical psychologists, Kalensky and Moore, in which they examined chronic marijuana smokers and came up with a separate syndrome in which they seemed to lose their motivation to do things. Now, for a long time, people wondered, well, is that because people that are unmotivated smoke marijuana, or is it because marijuana causes this to happen? And no one really knew the answer until a study was done with monkeys and marijuana. It was really hard to teach those monkeys to hold that joint. And <laughs> Actually, it was administered through a face mask designed to give levels the same as humans. There were four groups of monkeys. Uh, one group got marijuana every day, seven days a week, and for over a year. Second group got the marijuana just on weekends, you know, like at a fraternity party or something. 
Another group got a placebo, in case the monkeys could really tell the difference. <laughs> and then the fourth group got nothing. And what the researchers, without going into the details of the study, um, well, I'll tell you how they measured motivation in the monkeys. The monkeys were tested on a variety of different tests every day. One of the tests was called a progressive fixed ratio test. So the monkey had to press a bar to get a banana pellet. And then it had to press the bar twice to get a banana pellet. And then three times. And then four times. And then five times. And at some point, the monkey would say, to heck with it, it's not worth it, and stop pressing the bar. So what they found was that after at least nine months of either daily or just weekend use, the monkeys lost their motivation. They wouldn't press the bar as much. And the motivation problem persisted for at least two months after they stopped smoking. So that's the best. St we can't do that in humans, obviously. Of course, we'd like to try, but we can't. That's the best study we have showing an experimentally induced a motivational syndrome. So it is something, again, that's been documented in marijuana smokers, but we never know or never knew which came first. So that is a possibility. There's also the possibility of problems with uh, mental illness, and I'll talk about that shortly. Basically, uh, smoking marijuana increases the risk of developing schizophrenia. Just uh, let's look at that. Basically, the risk of psychosis increased by 40% in people who have used marijuana. This is a study uh, published in the Australian Journal of Psychiatry in 2008. They concluded that approximately 14% of psychotic outcomes in young people would not have occurred if they had not smoked marijuana. There have been several studies looking into this, and this summarizes them. Overall, uh, the average indicates that you basically double the likelihood of developing schizophrenia. And it's especially true if you're a teenager, and the higher the dose and the more you smoke it, the greater the risk. Do people become tolerant? to the effects of marijuana? Yes. Tolerance develops even at what you might consider normal use, normal recreational use. It's what is called a pharmacodynamic tolerance. That means it occurs in the brain. There are other types of tolerance, like metabolic tolerance that occurs in the liver, but that's not what help it happens with marijuana. It's the fact that your brain makes adjustments. And by tolerance, I mean you have to increase the dose to get the same effect. Can you become physically dependent on marijuana? How do you determine that someone is physically dependent on a drug? By the presence of withdrawal symptoms, if you remove it. And yes, people can become physically dependent. And if they're forced to stop using it, they go into withdrawal, which includes irritability, restlessness, decreased appetite, sleep problems, sweating, tremors, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Symptoms begin 48 hours after cessation and can last for a month or so. Well, now it's time to talk about medicinal marijuana, don't you think? That's what you've been waiting for. The Gallup poll of 2016 indicated that 89% of people think marijuana should be allowed for medicinal use. Why? Because they think it would have benefits for several conditions. Does the Food and Drug Administration agree? <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> the FDA have not deemed marijuana safe or effective 
in the treatment of any medical condition. Well, how can marijuana be a medicine? As we saw, it affects relaxation, memory, coordination, pain control, appetite. Oh, he didn't talk about the vomiting reflex, but it does affect that. So what medical problems would this be useful for? Well, let's look at why people use medical marijuana. The main reason, pain relief. And uh, as we will see, that seems to be one good use of it. That use does make sense. Uh, muscle spasms, yes. Uh, stimulate appetite or eliminate nausea, yes. Uh, relieve impression, uh, depression, yeah. We'll, we'll get to uh, some of that research shortly. Chronic pain. Chronic pain is a problem. It affects more than 25 million adults in the United States. And a 2017 review found that marijuana or products containing cannabinoids are effective in relieving chronic pain. Maybe it can relieve alcoholism and drug addiction. Another 2017 study revealed that using marijuana may help people with alcohol, alcohol or opioid dependencies. But this is controversial because another review suggests that marijuana be more like a gateway drug and increase the risk of people abusing other drugs. So that issue is not settled. What about treating depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. Well, another review looked at all the past published literature to see what effect marijuana might have. The authors found some evidence supporting the use of marijuana to treat depression and PTSD, but they cautioned that marijuana is not an appropriate treatment for other mental health conditions like bipolar disorder or psychosis. Marijuana might be effective, or uh, oral cannabinoids, uh, synthetic compounds, might be effective against nausea and vomiting that caused by chemotherapy. And even smoked marijuana might help alleviate these symptoms as well. might be some help in treating multiple sclerosis. The short-term use of oral cannabinoids may improve symptoms of spasticity. Spasticity is increased muscle tone. And people with MS, actually people with a lot of conditions, have spasticity. Um, so you have an increase in muscle tension, but it's only been tested, that is, marijuana has only been tested in treating the spasticity in multiple sclerosis, and modest improvement has been demonstrated. What about epilepsy? This is some of the most interesting research. A 2017 study showed that CBD, that again, the abbreviation for cannabidiol, one of the main ingredients in marijuana, may be effective easing seizures among children with Dravet syndrome, a rare form of epilepsy. Dravet syndrome seizures are prolonged, repetitive, and potentially lethal. In fact, one in five children with Dravet syndrome did not reach the age of 20. Several years ago, 60 Minutes ran a story on a child with Dravet syndrome who, whose parents took her out to uh, Colorado to get CBD oil to treat that. And her grandparents live in Appleton. And I was giving this talk in Appleton, and they were in the audience and spoke about their granddaughter and indicated that with the CBD oil, she was actually able to go to school and do very well. It was pretty much impossible for her prior to that. 
So this is a wonderful medication, it seems, for that disorder. This again talks about the CBD oil. Uh, it drastically reduces the number of seizures. There are some side effects, but they're relatively minor compared to the seizures. Uh, vomiting, fatigue, and fever. Now, people would love to use medical marijuana for many other things. In Colorado, they love to use it to treat all sorts of stuff. It might be effective in some of these things, but that requires more research. And as we'll see shortly, uh, research is a problem, mainly because it's a Schedule One drug. In Colorado, there are more medical marijuana dispensaries <laughs> in Denver than stores and liquor stores combined. So if you want some medical marijuana, you know where to go. <laughs> there are some ongoing clinical trials, and uh, we'll have to wait till they are done to see how useful it is. I've already mentioned multiple sclerosis. There is a spray, Sativex, that contains equal concentrations of THC and CBD, and that does help patients with MS. It reduces the spasticity and pain. It's possible that uh, marijuana might be of some benefit in treating Alzheimer's disease. We don't know yet. Trials are underway. Time will tell. Well, when we're talking about medical marijuana, exactly what are we talking about? Are we talking about the plant or a medicine? Well, there is the botanical cannabinoid, the plant, what most people think of when they think of medical marijuana, and then there are synthetic THC medications that are available in the United States. Right now, they've only been approved to relieve nausea or stimulate appetite. Uh, Dronabinol is FDA approved for treating, for improving appetite in HIV patients, and Nabilone approved for uh, reducing nausea. There are other medications not available in the U.S. Uh, Sativex, I mentioned that before. It's a spray for pain relief and muscle spasms in multiple sclerosis. And the pure CBD oil for treating childhood seizures. You can get it, but it's not FDA approved. So, if we're talking about medical marijuana versus the THC medications, which is better? Well, THC medications still have psychoactive effects because they have THC, that is, they make you high. But there are chemicals in medical marijuana, the plant, that moderate THC psychoactive effects. And these chemicals are not present, present in the medications. Mer medical marijuana is a lot cheaper because you don't have a company trying to make a lot of money off of it. Just grow it. Now, there are other things to consider when comparing the plant to the medications. <coughs> Smoked marijuana takes effect in minutes. The THC medications can take over an hour. Now, if you're smoking it and get the immediate effect, you can either increase, you can increase the dose if it's not having the effect you want. But they may also, people may also consume less if a small amount does have the effect that you want. If you're taking something orally, absorption is not as good from the stomach, and um, 
the effects are more unpredictable and possibly less effective. But the plant itself is not FDA approved. The FDA can't approve it because it's a plant. And it's going to be different everywhere depending on how it's bred. And you don't know if it's pure. It could be contaminated with pesticide, pesticides, mold, fungus. So if we look at some of the advantages of medical marijuana versus the advantages of THC medications, the medical marijuana, the plant itself, has chemicals that moderate THC's effects. It's less expensive, you get more immediate effects and instant feedback, less erratic absorption from the GI tract. But for the THC medications, they are FDA approved. The standardized formula, you know they're pure. You don't have to worry about lung cancer or emphysema. And you have a standardized dose. Now, as I indicated earlier, we need more research. There are research issues. The main one being marijuana is a Schedule I drug. It makes it really difficult to get approval to conduct the research. And what we really need are what are called prospective double-blind studies. What do we mean by prospective? There are two types of research designs. One is prospective, the other is retrospective. In prospective, you take someone, you follow them into the future. In retrospective, you look at someone now, try to figure out how they got there by looking at their past. The prospective studies are much better. We have virtually none of those with medical marijuana. You also want research studies that are double blind. So you've got one group receiving, say, a plant material that's a real thing, another receiving a placebo. Uh, dry oak leaves with oregano. <laughs> Fool my wife. So, and they don't know which is which. So, Neither the person administering it nor the subject receiving it knows if they've got the real thing. Those are called double-blind studies. There are none at the present time with medical marijuana. We need double-blind prospective studies. We also need studies that are longer than what they have been in the past. Past studies have been like a couple of weeks or at most a year. We'd really like to know the long-term effects. And again, uh, most studies have been conducted with the oral THC preparations. We'd like to know what's going on when smoking the plant. Okay, to summarize some of this, uh, most studies done to date are short, the small number of subjects, they're retrospective as they take people now and say, well, how did you get here? And they're confounded by uncontrolled variables. Uh, the people have got something else wrong with them. They might be addicted to another drug, for example. So some implications. The vast majority of these patients don't have debilitating illnesses. Most are young males will be exposed to the long-term effects of marijuana exposure. Studies are short-term and the patient risks will be the same as anyone else that uses the compound. So what are the pros and cons of medical marijuana? The pros are on the left, cons on the right. Pros, you're not going to die from using it, and that's good. It's not as addicting as other drugs, but marijuana can be addicting. People do seek treatment for marijuana addiction. The benefits demonstrated so far have been modest for a small segment of the population. Negatively, there are cognitive problems. 
and brain development can be altered, including increasing the risk of schizophrenia. You also have a risk of cancer and driving impairment. Okay, let's move now to CBD medication. CBD does not alter consciousness, but it might be able to treat epilepsy as well as anxiety, depression, schizophrenia, heart disease, and cancer. Cancer, yes, because CBD can block cancer cells from metastasizing. As we already mentioned, children treated with CBD ingested in droplet form, and they don't have to worry about lung problems, and as we said, it's quite effective in treating Dravet's disease. Now, they take CBD oil, but you're thinking, well, what is CBD oil? Well, I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> there are different levels of compounds found in the natural hemp or cannabis plant. CBD levels vary depending on how the plant is bred. Most CBD oil <laughs> comes from industrial hemp. <coughs> that is uh, hemp that's used to make um, clothing, for example. There was a CBD hemp plant in Beaverdam, Wisconsin. My wife grew up in Beaverdam, said so she played down there a lot. I guess that explains a lot. Mm. Anyway, makers of CBD oil, uh, whoops. makers of CBD oil use different methods to extract the CBD. It's then added to a carrier oil and called CBD oil. It comes in different strengths and is used in various ways. We don't know exactly how CBD works. We need more research. It stimulates a lot of different biochemical pathways, but it is a powerful anti-inflammatory and antioxidant agent. It increases levels of serotonin, as well as anandamide. Serotonin is a main neurotransmitter that's involved in the relief of depression. You may have heard of SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Those are antidepressants that increase serotonin levels in the brain. Well, CBD can do it too. CBD medication also, it seems, can increase the growth of new neurons in the brain, especially in the hippocampus. And there's a lot of good evidence that CBD can relieve chronic pain. People using CBD oil for arthritis find relief from their pain. And as I already mentioned, in multiple sclerosis, short-term use of CBD oil can reduce spasticity. That's that increased muscle tension. The results are modest, but they're in the right direction. And you're also not going to build up a tolerance the effects of CBD. Now there are some side effects of CBD oil, like tiredness, diarrhea, changes in appetite, and weight changes. And it may interact with, in unknown ways with other medications. But thousands of people around the country, perhaps some in Wapaka, I don't know, are using high CBD marijuana. People like Mikhail Kogan said that he's seen it work for a lot of his patients, and he prescribes high BC strains for epilepsy, PTSD, anxiety, autoimmune diseases, autism, and insomnia. Now, just because he prescribes it doesn't mean it works, but it might. There are a lot of physicians that feel that CBD is useful. It's safe and not psychoactive. But even so, as I've mentioned before, the federal government still, cl still classifies it as a Schedule I drug. Anything having anything to do with marijuana is a Schedule I drug as far as the federal government is concerned. 
How much does it cost for CBD medication? Well, it can be a hundred to a thousand dollars or so a month, which insurance doesn't cover. But if you're the parent of a child with Dravet syndrome, you'll pay anything. Most recently, it's been suggested that CBD might be useful in treating the opioid epidemic. Turns out states with legalized marijuana report a reduction in opioid use, lower number of prescription for opioid painkillers, and a reduced number of opioid overdoses. One reason for that is that CBD can reduce anxiety. And you don't have to worry about diversion under the black market. You're not going to have someone come up to you on the street and say, hey, want to buy some CBD? <laughs> not going to happen. We're now going to move on to a recent report that summarizes things. I'll go over this somewhat quick, quickly. Basically, uh, it says that in adults with chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, oral cannabinoids are effective against vomiting and nausea. And in adults with chronic pain, cannabinoids or cannabis produce a clinically significant reduction in pain symptoms. And as I already mentioned, in adults with MS, spasticity, uh, short-term use improves spasticity. For these conditions, the effects of cannabinoids are modest. For all other conditions evaluated, there's inadequate information. Again, we need more research. As far as mental health goes, as I mentioned earlier, marijuana use is likely to increase the risk for developing schizophrenia. The higher the use, the greater the risk. But marijuana use does not appear to increase the risk of developing depression, anxiety, or PTSD. But if you have bipolar disorder, it would not be wise to smoke marijuana. but heavy marijuana users are more likely to report thoughts of suicide. You may also increase the risk for developing social anxiety disorder. As a concluding slide, there's mounting anecdotal evidence from cannabis use, but the variability of the cannabis use together with limited information from clinical trials make it difficult to scientifically assess the multiple claims. We need more randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled studies. We need more research. And on that note, I will end, and thank you all for coming. If there are any questions, I will do my best to answer them. No. I think this woman is. Yes. My my question is, uh, who is responsible for? What body is responsible for the continued? identification of marijuana as a Schedule I drug, and how can that be changed? Well, that, that is a good question. The Food and Drug Administration, and I'm not sure of exactly what level in that, but they make the decision. And it's usually based on a working group of scientists, but it is not immune from uh, political pressure. 
So it's not something that can be legislated? I would hope so, but I doubt it. The legislature, as far as I know, doesn't have anything per se to do with it. it it's <coughs> based on a scientific evaluation, but who appoints the scientists might depend on politics. Okay, and I, I have a kind of connected question because the, the opioid crisis is something that everybody's taking. Yes. Are approved by the FDA. And, yes. Um, and the drug companies have been making a lot of money on that. And is so it sort of seems to me that it might be um, a money issue. Yes, it is. Well, it could be, and that's that. Yeah, the opioid epidemic is a major problem, and. The FDA used to crack down on uh, uh, companies that manufactured too much of the drugs, like OxyContin, and too easily distributed them. But because of Congress uh, pressuring the FDA, that program was stopped. So there's politics involved in all of that, unfortunately. Yes. You may or may not know that the uh, CBD oil is sold at the nutrition store on Main Street in Wapaka, and it's about $99 for a bottle that lasts a month. I did not know that. <laughs> but now you know. Thank you, sir. And are you selling something at the back there? <laughs> I think someone else has got a question over there. I guess. I was wondering where we were in Wisconsin for medical marijuana, but it seems to be just answered. Yeah, I think that CBD oil is legal, but I don't know about uh, the plant itself. There's a question right here. Oh, I said a question about Parkinson's disease. Yes. Parkinson's. Well, Parkinson's, I'm not aware of any research on um, use of medical marijuana for Parkinson's disease, but Parkinson's disease has both uh, or can have both cognitive and movement problems, and I would, including spasticity. So it's certainly conceivable that it could help it. But I'm not aware of any ongoing clinical trials on that. If, if the government has had a patent on this drug, or so-called marijuana in the 60s, why are they sitting on it? And is it the pharma that's just keeping everything until when the poor people that are on medicine that really need this medicine instead? Well, the government doesn't have a patent on marijuana. There are some drug companies that have patents on certain uh, types of medication like the nasal spray containing equal CBD and THC. But you can't patent a plant. And the plant itself is not patented. There's a question there. How, how does the CBD oil help with anxiety and depression? I mean, does it take into effect right away? Does it take a while? Do you know much well, more about that? I have not read the article, so I do not know. But the, I assume that it's because CBD alters serotonin levels. And serotonin levels, as I mentioned, are involved in depression. Now, the CBD may alter them in very complicated ways because uh, serotonin is involved in relieving depression, 
but it's through a complicated pathway. Uh, something like uh, Prozac, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, will increase the amount of serotonin, but that in turn decreases the number of serotonin receptors, and that in turn increases the amount of a chemical called cyclic AMP, and that in turn increases another compound called cyclic AMP response element binding protein, and that in turn <laughs> increases a compound called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF, is its abbreviation, and it is the increase in BDNF that relieves the depression. BDNF is basically like miracle growth for the brain. It makes your neurons happier and healthier. So, you know, CBD could somehow alter that whole cascade of events. But we need more research to find out. Yes. I have a couple things. Um, one thing, if our body makes um, our own endocannabinoids, yes. or we have that ability, can you tell us how to make those? <laughs> uh, no, I can't tell you to do that. Uh, they are uh, they are uh, lipid uh, fat type uh, molecules. So don't don't drink skim milk, I guess. <laughs> but I really don't know what you would have to do to in increase that. I had read some research, and part of it was to like sports, athletics, and also um, sexual orgasm. And can release them. Uh, second part, um, in the 70s, UWSP did research on um, tolerance, and they found out that there was reverse tolerance for marijuana. Well, you, you can have reverse tolerance or what's called sensitization. Um, there was a debate for a long time whether or not uh, tolerance occurred to marijuana, and it was finally resolved that, that it does, I believe, that tolerance does develop. There was also a debate about whether or not marijuana was addicting, and now we know it is. How did marijuana ever become a Schedule One drug? Uh, well, it all began in the 1930s when uh, the Federal Bureau of Narcotics um, went after marijuana. Harry Anslinger was the first federal drug czar, and he mounted a campaign to convince the government that marijuana was a social menace. And he and people working with him reported to Congress how uh, marijuana caused a crime and sexual perversion <laughs> and helped produce the movie called Reefer Madness and got the government to uh, pass uh, the 1937 Marijuana Tax Act. That's what really got the ball rolling. And basically, as a result of Harry Anslinger's efforts, marijuana got included <coughs> with heroin and cocaine. And as heroin and cocaine penalties rose through the years, marijuana automatically rose with them. And when 1970 came along and these five schedules were established, cocaine, heroin, and marijuana were all put in Schedule One together. I think we have room uh, time for one more question. I think there's someone questions. And uh, after those questions, we uh, would appreciate your help in stacking the chairs on the trolleys if uh, you're able. So if you have the motivation. If you have the motivation. <laughs> yeah. You can either hit the bar. Right. Are there medical differences between uh, cannabis indica versus cannabis uh, indica? Saliva versus indica? Yes. Uh, indica is more potent. And actually, um, in trying to grow the more potent marijuana now, uh, the male, 
Marijuana is a dioecious species. They're male and female plants. And to grow the most potent marijuana, the male plants are weeded out, tossed away. <laughs> and that results in the female plant producing more of the resin, which contains the THC. Uh, it's called cinsamilla, uh, and that's the more potent. I think that answered your question. Um, I have a question about what the government has done over the years that I can remember. I'm back here, sir. Oh, yes. <laughs> OK. Uh, we've, we've prohibited laws for so long. I still remember the uh, non-drinking. I mean, when I think back with Al Capone and the whole gang, as, all right, the same thing goes, it seems, with every kind of illegal drug. Every time we try to ban it, for some reason, it seems to appear. And I think of what's going on with the opioid uh, epidemic. All right, tonight I watch David Muir. Three quarters of the show seems to be ads for prescriptions. And then they give every one of the things that can occur to you if you happen to take this prescription. I truly feel the drug companies are doing this because most of us could grow this plant in our yards. And we could go through a lot of these uh, situations that uh, these symptoms that many of us have that many of the things that I saw advertised on TV tonight, the medical marijuana would take care of some of that. And that would be my risk, no more than any of the prescriptions I take from a doctor. Well, there are a couple of things you mentioned that I'd like to comment on. One was Al Capone. <laughs> Interesting that you knew Al Capone. <laughs> but the, the marijuana distribution network here in the United States began because of the 18th Amendment, prohibition. Prohibition basically did four things. It made alcoholic beverages more difficult to secure. It made alcoholic beverages inferior in quality. And it made alcoholic beverages more expensive. And the fourth thing, it stimulated the development of a marijuana distribution network. <laughs> That's how it all got started. Now, in terms of your other comments, marijuana might be useful for many things, but we need more research. That's all I can say. Thank you. And uh, we appreciate you coming and uh, give a note.